Hello, and welcome back to Chess Openings Explained. As always, my name is Caleb Denby, and today I'm going to be taking you through part nine of the Nidorf. That's right, we are already through eight hours of instruction on this one single chess opening, and we are going to keep on trucking tonight. Uh, tonight, of course, I am covering the sort of newest popular line against the Nidorf. It's not that new, but it is sort of uh, the thing that a lot of top level players do these days to get just, you know, an, a nice game against the Nidorf. Uh, I feel like from the white player's perspective, they don't have to know as much sort of razor sharp theory with this line. And if black isn't careful, he, you, uh, you can get into a, a little bit of trouble here. So what line am I talking about? Of course, I am talking about the move 6H3 for white in the Night Orf. So let's jump into it here and see how uh, the players with the black pieces have developed the theory in this opening line. So to start off with, we have a game between Sergei Karyakin and Maxime Vashir Lagrave and a bug in the studio, but I will survive that. Uh, and this game I wanted to go over, it was actually a rapid game from Paris a few years back, but it shows how this h3 variation isn't actually that safe for white if you slip up a little bit in the opening as Sergei does here. So here we have Sergei with the white pieces, he chooses e4 of course, we have c5, knight f3, d6, d4, c takes, knight takes, knight f6, knight c3, and a6, arriving of course at the Nidorf. And of course the topic of today's discussion is the move 6h3. So, so far in our Nidorf series we have covered all manner of sixth moves by white, the razor sharp bishop g5, the ever popular English attack, the fisher sozin with bishop c4, the bishop e2 variations, I think we also took a look at some f3 and f4 nonsense as well, and in all of these moves, there's always sort of a downside to white committing to one of these moves with, uh, you know, the white pieces here. So, for example, bishop e3 means that this bishop's never coming to g5. It means it's never going to capture on f4 in one tempo. So black no longer has to worry as much about those lines. Bishop e2 or bishop c4, well then, of course, this bishop is committed to those squares. You know, it's not going to make a second move early on in the opening, at least rarely so. And committing the f-pawn to moving can also be sort of uh, dangerous for white. You know, you're revealing information to black with any of these moves. So h3 is one of those moves that is uh, sort of related to the numerous uh, sidelines that white can play in the Nidorf, where you sort of just, you know, take a second on move 6 and say, I'm not going to show you too much about what my intentions are. I'm not going to commit this bishop to e3, f4, or g5. I'm not going to commit this bishop to e2 or c4. I'm going to play h3, and I'm going to keep my options open. And in the meantime, h3 is going to be a pretty useful move for me. I'm going to be able to prepare the move g4, which is, of course, a strong attacking move. But with that being said, I'm not necessarily against playing f4 either. So, with the black pieces, what can you do against this move? Well, I am actually going to recommend the typical Nidorf move here, which is the move e5. Now, uh, one of the references material, one of the reference materials that I've been using while I'm going over uh, the Nidorf here, has been the Nidorf Simplified series on Chessable by Alex Korlovich, and in that he actually recommends uh, e6. And in the work that I did to prepare for this lecture. Uh, I came to the understanding that he probably recommended e6 because his course is called the Knight of Simplified, and e6, I think, is a bit simpler for black to play. And his idea is to play the move e6 and d5. However, those lines looked pretty boring for, for black, in my opinion, and I'm also not entirely convinced that black was equalizing in all of those lines. So why play a boring line that might not equalize when you can just play the straight-up Nidorf? So, Pawn to e5 is my recommendation here. Uh, now, thanks to white not committing this bishop yet to e2, as we would see in some of the slower positional variations, white has the interesting option here uh, of the main move, actually, in this position, dropping the knight back to e2. Uh, and I think this is probably what white should play. Uh, white has, of course, the option to step back to b3, and we're going to take a look at this as well. And on a rare day, uh, white might even consider dropping this knight back to f3, although I think this makes the least sense with the move 6h3. So knight d to e2 is what we're starting with here today, the main stuff. And now 
players with the black pieces have opted for this move h5. Now, why play h5? Well, it's pretty obvious, it's pretty apparent. We want to control the g4 square. That's why we stick our pawn on h5. With h3, white says, I would like to play g4. And with h5, we say, well, good luck with that. Uh, what is the downside to this move? Well, chat room, you tell me. Why in previous lectures have we avoided playing h5 this early on? There's a very important reason why h5 is generally avoided on as early as move 7. So what do you think, chat room? The chat room thinks we should start a chess TikTok. I'm not against it. Not against it. And yeah, Manny has, in general, the, uh, the right idea here. The problem with h5, in many cases, is that we weaken the g5 square. Uh, now in this case, after the move knight d to e2, we're actually not going to be as concerned about it. The move bishop g5 definitely is playable for white, but it's not as scary because this knight landed on the e2 square. Uh, very often, uh, in variations where the knight lands on b3, you have to be a little bit more concerned about this bishop g5 idea because after knight d5, this bishop remains wide open. It can often step to squares like c4. Uh, that is to say, with the knight on b3, I would be much, much more scared of this than I am with this bishop here on g5. Uh, with all that in mind, uh, we are not going to look at bishop g5 first. We're going to take a look at that a little bit later in the lecture. Instead, we're going to look at the main move, g3. But just a brief word on why h5 isn't always played in the Nidorf. It's because this bishop g5 idea can be a little scary, but we're not as scared of it here because this bishop is for the moment, hemmed in by this knight. But yeah, more on bishop g5 later. For the moment, we are going to stick with this move, g3, the main move for white in the position. Now, what is the point of g3? Well, of course, white is interested in putting this bishop on g2, supporting this pawn from behind, and plopping a knight onto the d5 square, as white so often does in the Nidorf. Uh, how should black combat this? Well, luckily for black, he's playing the Nidorf, and I was speaking with, uh, actually, Dennis Borosh earlier today about the Nidorf, and he's like, yeah, it's a great opening because all your pieces just always have squares. And so, as always, we put our pieces on squares, bishop e6. We're not so concerned about f4 since our opponent has wasted some time here. Bishop g2 is the natural follow-up, and now after b5, Black has a perfectly fine game. And as Dennis Boros said, all your pieces have squares, right? Your pieces just have squares to, uh, to land on. White went ahead or, and castled kingside in this game, and black plays the move knight b to d7. Uh, we're for the moment delaying developing this bishop because the fight for the d5 square is coming rather quickly. So we want to make sure we sort of have all our ducks in a row. We have our d5 square well covered by these two pieces and this knight for reinforcement before playing bishop e7 here. Uh, bishop e3 is the natural follow-up now for white, just getting the pieces developed. And finally, black goes ahead and plays bishop e7. Uh, in this game, we saw the move knight to d5, which is by far the main move in the position. You can also actually see this move a4, but black is just going to push to b4, and we're going to get very, very similar positions here, just with these two moves sort of uh, uh, inserted. And the play is not going to be that radically different. Of course, black is going to have some play on the queen side uh, with this advanced b pawn, and likely some files are going to open up over there. But for the moment, let's stick with the main move, knight d5. Uh, and here we have two options we can take with the knight, or we can take with the bishop. And now, if your goal in life is to avoid long, complicated opening theory, uh, sort of at, at any cost, I would recommend the move bishop takes d5. Uh, with that being said, after e takes d5 and kingside castles, for example, queen d2, uh, it's true that black gets a position where you sort of just play normal knight or moves, get some pressure on the queen side, expand a little bit over here, maybe knight b6 and knight c4 to follow, and you can sort of just play chess from here on out. With that being said, I sort of hate to give up the bishop pair here. For the moment, this bishop on g2 doesn't actually look all that impressive, but in the long run, I think it might come back to bite black, the fact that he has uh, given up the, the light squared bishop so easily in this case. So I do think objectively the best move here is knight takes d5, and I think it's worth playing. 
Uh, e takes d5, bishop f5, and now the downside is that this is a little bit more theoretical, and you do have to be a little bit, uh, a little bit ready. Um, yeah, and hello to everyone. Hello, hello. Uh, a couple questions that we're gonna get to eventually, but thank you for the questions, chat. Thank you. We'll 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 get back around to those hopefully. Uh, and now f4 is is the idea here. And this is why this line is a little bit more theoretical. By capturing on d5 uh, and losing time with your bishop, black for the moment temporarily misplaces his pieces uh, and is going to have to work pretty hard to get everything sort of back in order. Of course, this bishop on f5 is undefended. Uh, it is vulnerable to tactics involving uh, f takes e5 and rook takes f5. And of course, we just spent some time to even put the bishop here. Uh, with that in mind, though, I do think keeping the bishop is better, as I said. And after the move rook c8, gaining a tempo on the c2 pawn, no time for this. We can take here uh, with an attack on the queen. c3 by white to preserve the pawn. And now I like the move bishop h7. g6 is also playable, but I like the move bishop h7. Uh, and from here, black is doing uh, pr pretty reasonably well. Uh, in the game that we're going to look at today, Sergei Karyakin goes a little bit wrong with his next move. Uh, Karyakin chose the move queen to e1, which on its surface looks like a perfectly fine move, but uh, it goes to show that if white is not uh, super well prepared in this opening, then white could very much get into, get into a little bit of trouble uh, very, very quickly with natural looking moves like queen to e1. So what should Sergei have done? Well, the fact of the matter is, white has already given up quite a bit to black in this position. Uh, white has cemented this pawn on t5, which at first might seem like a good thing, but in reality, this pawn is more of a target than it is a strength on the d5 square. Of course, later on, a knight might come to f6 or b6 and target it. Additionally, the black rook is well placed on the c file. Black's uh, pawn structure on the queen side is perfectly fine. And uh, white has not too much of an attack on the king's side. In addition, this bishop doesn't look great. This knight doesn't really make a lasting impression either. So since white has given up so much, uh, white very much has to capitalize on the time that black has lost right away. And I mean like right away. If white does not capitalize on that lost time, then he's going to be stuck with uh, the sort of position that Sergei got in this game. So how can white capitalize here? What do you think, chat? What should white play immediately after bishop h7? You have to strike while the iron is hot and make sure that black can't uh, sort of solve all of, uh, all of the opening problems. Uh, Matthew asks, what application I'm using? I am, of course, using leechess.org. Okay, we have some suggest suggestions in the chats. Uh, Manny suggests the move f5. Why is that word so hard to say? Uh, the move a4 has also been suggested. Uh, Jason says, why G-O-F-5? I don't know what that means, but maybe he's also saying F5. G4 is on the cards. Bishop D3 is suggested. I don't know how I feel about that move. Could be illegal. And yeah, F takes E5 has been suggested. So F5 isn't really going to be the right idea here. Why isn't F5 the right idea? Well, black can, again, solve some opening problems with Bishop G5. Uh, after something like bishop f2 to preserve the bishop, well, then this, this pawn would be hanging, right? If queen d2, perhaps this is better. But at the same time, uh, black is still getting castled, and we're not super concerned about this move g4 because we can find some very nice activity with moves like queen h4, moves like uh, rook c4, and this pawn is, again, going to be a bit more of a weakness than it is, uh, than it is a strength. I think black is pretty significantly better here. Uh, and yeah, same thing with g4 immediately. Perhaps we can just take this guy and activate our bishop, right? So the moves that white can play here are, I think f takes e5 is perhaps the most challenging, and the move a4, uh, which sort of aims for play on the queen side instead. So let's look at a4 first. Uh, 
black can go ahead and get castled. White can play a takes b5, a takes b5. And then white goes for this move rook a6 rather directly. And this is how white is applying some pressure uh, in this case. Now, uh, white, I think, has won one out of 17 games that we have in the database here, and the rest have been drawn. And black is basically just fine after the move rook to a8. Uh, there's also a game between uh, Maxim Bashir-Lagrov and Anish Giri that continued with e takes f4 here, knight takes f4, h4, and after bishop d4, Maxime just gets this knight to e, or sorry, Giri just gets the knight to e5. Believe it or not, Maxime actually had white in this knight orf. Knight h5, bishop g6, and they went ahead and repeated here. And so I don't think a4 is really the most, most testing line, I should say. The reason for that is because, uh, number one, there's this rook a8 line, which I didn't actually look at too much. But number two, this line with e takes f4, which is a little bit less common, but was played by Nishigiri at the top level, uh, should be perfectly fine for black. And the reason for that is... Uh, white did not have time to take on e5, and black is able to sort of establish this knight on e5, and with that knight on e5, uh, black shouldn't have too much difficulty uh, straight out of the opening. So I think the more testing variation, rather than a4, is to play f takes e5 sort of while you can. a4 would be a great inclusion, but I think allowing black to take on f4 is a little bit too much for white. You get this strong knight on e5, and then obviously you don't have to end the game in a repetition like MVL and Geary did. But uh, I think black is going to be getting some pretty nice play there with the central knight. So f takes e5 immediately. And now, what's the big idea? Well, in a perfect world, uh, black would love to play knight takes e5, get castled, and sort of go about, uh, go about business as usual. However, in this case, now suddenly this knight on e2, which looked a little bit forlorn, can spring into play with the move knight d4. If you sort of continue nonchalantly with castles, Knight c6 is actually going to be white's plan. And all of a sudden, both of white's pieces, which didn't make too much sense, are suddenly making a lot of sense. Knight takes c6 and d takes c6, and this is starting to look catastrophic now for white. This bishop on the nice long diagonal supporting the strong pawn on c6, and uh, black is going to be pretty significantly worse here. So I think instead of knight takes e5, black should play d takes e5, as has been played in all 30 games in the database I'm using. Uh, of course, the downside to this now is that by drawing this pawn out to e5, white is able to play this move d6. And this, I think, is definitely the most testing variation here for white. Uh, you get this strong pawn on d6, and now, even though uh, black's pieces are all going to make sense, you have successfully opened up this bishop on the long diagonal. You've given black a very serious problem with this pawn on d6, and it's going to require a little bit of accuracy by black in order to uh, equalize here. That being said, I wouldn't recommend this line if I didn't think black was equalizing, and so after bishop g5, I think black should do all right. Uh, now there are a couple things you have to look out for here. White can play queen d2 or bishop f2. After queen d2, we of course would love to trade off the dark squared bishops. Black is going to castle on the king side, rook a d1 for example. And from here, something like rook b8, queen b6, and aiming for an endgame are going to be uh, the plans for black. You of course are also looking to open things up on the queen side a little bit. And I don't think black is worse here at all. I sort of ended my opening prep here because black can play any number of moves. h4, rook b8, bishop g6, uh, queen b6, and, and sort of be equal from here on out after rook a to d1. The key, of course, is to make sure that this pawn doesn't queen and to try to prove that it's more of a weakness than it is a strength. Black can also aim to play moves like e4 a little bit later on to kick this bishop out of the game and make uh, sort of the counterpart to this d-pawn felt in the game as, as well. Uh, with all that in mind, none of this happened in this game. Uh, and of course, I should briefly mention bishop f2. Uh, it's going to be sort of the same story here. White's going to play something like a4. And now we're going to look to activate our pieces once again. I think the move b4 is actually the best here, although it has not yet been tested over the board. c takes b4, for example, and rook c2. And looking for ex some activity here with, with black. 
And again, the key is going to be making sure this pawn doesn't get too far up the board and pressuring it just a little bit while you still activate the pieces. And I'm not going to lie to you and say that this position is easy, but uh, I, I don't think you're going to be facing too much deep preparation uh, beyond this point. I think at this point, it's just going to be a rather complex chess game that uh, you're going to have to work out over the board. Uh, moves like queen b8, though, doubling on the c-file, and yeah, pressure on the queen side and pressure on this pawn are the common elements to, uh, to look out for. With all that in mind, that is the main stuff. However, in this game, we saw none of that. Uh, in this game, Lee Chess is sort of hurting me here. I cannot find my main variation. We're going to have to skip to the end and come back. In this game, after f4, we saw rook c8, c3, bishop h7, as we were talking about. And then those two lines that I mentioned were a4, going for rook a6 and some pressure, but I didn't think it was too, too bad for black because knight e5 is a strong central knight. And f takes e5, which I thought was going to be a bit more challenging with white establishing a pawn on d6. However, the highest rated game in the database is this game between Sergei Karyakin and Maxime Vichelagrav. And in this game, of course, we saw the move queen to e1. And I think this is going to happen more often than, uh, than you might expect, right? You sort of always anticipate that your opponent knows all the theory and has outprepared you. But at this point, we are pretty deep into the game. And I think expecting a move like queen e1, some kind of move that just is... Uh, that, that looks rather playable and isn't these long forcing variations is, is perfectly reasonable. So queen e1 and Maxime opted just to castle, which is perfectly fine. Uh, now rook d1 was the choice by Sergei Karyakin, and now Maxime takes this opportunity to uh, strike back on the king's side with the move h4. So h4 loosens up these uh, dark squares for black, for white rather. We see the move g4. And now Maxime takes on f4. And I think this is why, uh, well, actually, I know this is why I picked this game uh, to go over, because it shows you what black should be aiming for here. Uh, basically, in this case, we have these downsides for white, where this bishop is stunted by its own pawn, and none of the downsides that white should be looking to get from black. We saw that this rook came to d1 rather than try to activate along the a file. We also saw that white was unable to force d takes e5 and getting this pawn out to d6. So if your opponent opts for something a little bit slower, a little less forcing than those main variations that I talked about, this is exactly what you should aim to do with the black pieces. Take on f4, keep this pawn here on d5, get a strong central knight on e5, and activate your bishop along this diagonal. That's exactly what Maxime does. Uh, knight takes f4 with Sergei Karyakin's choice, and now bishop g5 activates this bishop, opens up this e-file as well. Bishop d4 by Sergei Karyakin, and now rook e8. Uh, Maxime just puts his rook on the open file and puts all of his pieces on very natural squares. Clean f2, and I'll bet you can guess the next move, just knight to e5. It's very, very simple chess that Maxime is playing, but it's also very, very powerful chess. He puts all of his pieces on good squares, and that's what the Nidorf is really about. Uh, rook d to e1 is now played by Sergei, perhaps admitting that rook d1 was not the most accurate move of all time. And Maxime doesn't continue uh, with you know, the, the most accurate uh, moves of all time. The engine wants to play something like queen f6, but that move looks a little scary. He just plays natural simple chess, and it's good enough. He plays queen d7, connects the rooks, defends this f7 pawn, and just all of black's pieces are placed very, very well, with uh, the bishops on long diagonals, a powerful central knight, the rook on the c-file, the other rook on the e-file, and black should be substantially better here. And this is what you should aim for with black and sort of all of these variations. Just aim to have your pieces on good squares. Uh, bishop e4 was Sergei's choice, perhaps realizing that black's pieces were better than his. He tries now to trade some of them off. Bishop takes e4, rook takes e4, and now queen b7. And we're arriving now at the problem in white's position. This pawn on d5 is just a weakness. Uh, a3 was Sergei's choice, but at this point, uh, after rook c7, black is now threatening to take and take with the f pawn defended. We see bishop takes e5, trying to avoid some of these lines, but now d takes e5, and this knight is 
sort of attacked. I don't know if it's actually attacked, but it's attacked enough. Rook f to e1 to make sure that this pin is real. Uh, and now rook c4 increases the pressure along the fourth rank. We see takes, takes, knight g2, and Maxime Bashir Lagrav does end up winning this pawn on d5. And I think this is very much just the model game for this variation in the Nidorf. Maxime did everything by the book, and Sergei sort of just got crushed for it. Uh, Karyakin does win this pawn on h4 back for it, but of course the d-pawn was much more valuable than this h-pawn. Now we see e4, and this pawn starts marching down the board. e3, queen e2, g6 to kick the knight, knight to d4, bishop h4 now, and bishop f2 check. And Sergei felt the need to sacrifice the exchange and did go on to lose this endgame. Uh, and yeah, that was the story of the game. So I know I introduced those sort of more forcing variations rather quickly there, but that's just the type of thing that you need to go over and uh, make an effort to memorize, unfortunately. I do think, however, that most of the games you play in variations like this, uh, in the 6h3 mainline stuff with g3, are going to go more similar to this game than those games. You must be playing somebody who is pretty well prepared to get all the way to the end of those f takes e5 variations. The important things to remember in this variation, I'll go over from the top. After h3, e5, if white plays the main move, knight d to e2, that's when we're going to put this pawn on h5 to discourage the g4 stuff. Uh, bishop g5, we'll talk about next, but first the move g3 is the main move. And here I like playing the move bishop e6. There was a question in the chat about playing bishop e7 first, and I think this is reasonable, but uh, I do like playing bishop e6 first in this case. Uh, the question was, uh, he likes playing bishop e7 first because he always has to think if bishop e6 is playable, so he says in the chat. But in this case, with white playing h3 and g3, the move f4 isn't really going to be uh, that big of a threat here. White has just wasted too much time, and f5 isn't really going to be a threat with this bishop able to step to c4 now. So bishop e6 first I like a bit better, just because I want to defend the d5 square as much as possible, because that is what white is aiming after. Bishop g2, and now b5 by black. And knight bd7, bishop e7 does eventually come. And after knight d5, the simple move I said was bishop takes d5, but I think the best move is knight, knight takes d5, bishop f5. Now, if white knows anything about anything, white should play the move f4 here, uh, highlighting the fact that we've lost some time with our bishop, and it's currently undefended. Rook c8 gains a tempo on the pawn. c3, bishop h7 defends this bishop. Now, f takes e5 should be played, and after d takes e5, d6, bishop g5. And we have a very double-edged position where white has this advanced pawn on d6, black is going to be aiming to target it as well as find counterplay on the queen side and in the center with ideas of e4 later on. And uh, yeah, white is going to be trying to prove that this d6 pawn is a strength by uh, you know pushing it sort of up the board, also targeting things on the f file, and it's going to be a rather complex game. In this case, though, we saw white go queen e1, and Maxime thoroughly outplay Sergei after taking on f4 and establishing a strong knight on e5. Not right away, rather, but here, establishing a strong knight on e5, and black was just significantly better in this game. So I want to open up to any questions in the chat room of this variation in particular, uh, or you know, just this game between Sergei and Maxime. Uh, in the first game of our 6h3 variation. So go ahead, chat. Ask me any and all questions as I get that back open uh, on my phone here. Mm -mm. OK, we have a couple questions. If you play knight f3 instead of knight e2, is there a better chance to spend a knight on d5? So we'll go over knight f3, um, actually, I think, close to the end. Uh, but it's actually not too, too challenging at all. But yet, yeah, stay tuned for knight f3. After e takes f4, uh, can white try this idea of uh, knight d4, knight c6 again? Uh, I guess so. If you play something like bishop g5, uh, I mean, sorry, bishop f4, that's sort of going for this knight d4 idea, but it is going to be a bit slow here. For example, uh, bishop g5 can be played first. If you go knight d4 now, we can take this guy. And after queen g5, the knight can still come to c6 if it, well, sorry, it can't here. You have to defend it first. 
uh, for example, knight e5, and the knight can still come to c6 here, but, well, okay, now I'm hanging knight d3, sort of showing you that there are always complications uh, in the knight orf. The knight could still land on c6 here, hopefully, unless I'm blundering something. But now, if you notice, white has spent so much time getting the knight here that both of these pieces, the bishop on e7 and the queen on d8, have sort of vacated. And this knight isn't doing much more than challenging a knight on e5, which is sort of not its ideal. For example, after the move rook c to e8, uh, I think white's best option is to actually trade these knights off. You know, this knight on c6 looks great. What does it do? Not much aside from contest the knight on e5 by, uh, by black. So you can still try to go after this idea, but it is going to be, I think, just far too slow. Can you not go b takes d6 with white? Uh, oh, here? Interesting question. Um, no. This is check. This is check. This is a pretty classic tactic in all of these openings. Good question, though. I forgot to, forgot to mention. Um, OK. Am I a Nidorf player? Well, the idea of this series was that you learned the Nidorf with me. So basically, what I have been doing, uh, for those of you who don't know, because the, the point of this series might have been lost along the way, uh, is that I have always seen the Nidorf as sort of the mother of all chess openings that are difficult to learn. You know, it's sort of the most complex, it's heavily theoretical, the positions are very sharp. And so I wanted to take an approach as a player completely new to the Nidorf looking at the various options for black and picking the ones that make sense to me, that were understood by me. So uh, basically the idea was I would find the variations that I thought made the most sense to a player starting just to learn the Nidorf, the variations that can get you off the ground playing the Nidorf uh, from the get-go, and trying to explain those in, in the hour. So no, I am not the most experienced Nidorf player in the world, but I'm trying to use that to my advantage. Anyways, enough questions. We're wasting too much time. On to the next game. So up next, we have a game between Etienne Bacro and Marcus Rager. And I've sort of skipped ahead here. Sorry. Of course, we had the regular Nidorf opening moves. The move h3, as always, e5. And now I want to take a look at what happens if instead of the most popular move, knight d to e2, if white plays this move, knight b3 instead. So after knight b3, should we play the move h5? What do you think, chat? Should h5 be played here? So yeah, x factor in the chat says he's also new to the Nidorf, and he's also seen the Nidorf as the uh, sort of most difficult chess opening to try to learn. And yeah. You know, the idea was that we would be able to pick it up together, but now it's been like two months and eight hours of lectures, so maybe I've only proven that, uh, that it is a difficult opening. So no, of course we should not play the move h5. Why should we not play the move h5? Well, now bishop g5 is going to be a bit tougher for us to deal with. The reason being, this bishop is not hemmed in, blocked on uh, f1, as we saw in the previous variation. And white's development is going to be much more natural than in the line we just looked at. For example, if bishop e6 were to be played, and sorry, we actually haven't looked at uh, the bishop g5 line yet. We're going to look at that last. Uh, something like f4 could already come, and things are just going to be difficult for black. So the thing to remember, knight d uh, to e2, then h5 is the move. Knight b3 is an attempt to make h5 a little bit worse, because these bishop g5 lines are just going to be more natural for white. So rather than h5, I'm going to recommend the move bishop e7. Bishop e6 is also playable, but then f4 is going to be a little bit tough once, once again. And I understand that it seems sort of arbitrary when bishop e6 runs at f4 and when it doesn't. The reason why I'm claiming it doesn't run into f4 here is because we see white waste this extra tempo with g3 and put this knight back on e2. Because of these two moves, I'm comfortable putting the bishop on e6 here. However, after knight to b3, if bishop e6, f4, this is actually almost a direct transposition to something we have looked at before. If black plays the move bishop e7 and white plays the move bishop e3, bada bing, bada boom, we are in the English attack. And I have actually covered this exact variation. However, for white, obviously, 
he might consider not playing the move bishop e3 here. And then you're in a little bit of trouble because the move f5 might come. And while I don't think black is losing in this variation, I do think it might be rather difficult to get total equality out of this, with white just having so much space on the king's side so early on. So we're hoping to dodge that by playing the move bishop e7. Uh, and now there are actually two main ideas here for white. If the move bishop e3 is played after bishop e6, Believe it or not, we are just directly in the variations that I went over in my English attack lecture. Uh, just as a very brief review, the idea now is after f4, white has wasted time by playing the move bishop e3, so we are happy to capture and play knight c6. And here, black goes to establish a knight on e5, support it with a knight, on, uh, knight f to d7, and after this, stuff like rook c8, b5, knight b6 to a4, Castle's king side, rook e8. These types of moves are what black is going to do. If you want more details on that, go watch the English attack lecture. I don't have all night. Anyways, so that's bishop e3 here. That's just a transpositional move that would take you back into the English attack after bishop e6, which is perfectly natural. So what else can white do? Well, what's the point of h3? The point of h3 is to play g4, right? So g4 is probably what you're going to run into more often. Uh, and after g4, black is faced with a difficult decision. We would love to continue natural development with stuff like bishop e6 and knight b to d7, but then the move g5 might be hitting us. So I like the move h6 here. Uh, just stopping g5 in its tracks for the moment, and after this, white is most likely just going to start normal development once again. Uh, there are various ways to develop here for black, but I have chosen a very specific way to develop that sort of kills uh, white's attack almost entirely, in my opinion. And that's why I picked this line. I actually spent uh, sort of a, a couple hours just staring at different variations here and always wondering why it felt like black was on the, the worst side of getting attacked until I finally stumbled across this idea by black, which I do think sort of uh, solves, solves black's problems pretty, pretty thoroughly here. So what is that idea? Well, the idea is to actually, in tandem with this move, h6, start taking over all of the dark squares on the king's side. If black manages to take over all of these dark squares, there's sort of nothing to fear from white's attack. So what's the way to do that? Well, the way that I found is with knight b to d7. Uh, now it's in white's best interest to play the move a4 to stunt black's uh, counterplay on the queen's side before it ever gets started. And now the idea for black is to actually play this move knight f8, and after queen d2, we can start with the normal developing move, bishop e6, or you can play knight g6 immediately. I could not find a sensible difference between the two. I think they just transpose. But we'll start with bishop e6, because that was played in this game, queenside castles, and now knight g6. And this is the setup that I am recommending with black here. You bring this knight from d7 to f8 to g6, and you are controlling the f4 square, and in many cases, the h4 square as well. Now, white's idea in this variation is to put a knight on d5 to start with. This is sort of goal number one for white. Goal number two is to, you know, like come checkmate black, but goal number one is to put this knight on d5. He would love to do so immediately, but this pawn is hanging. You know, tough, tough call, which is why the move f3 is uh, pretty much the only move that gets played here. King b1 can be played as well, but it's almost immediately followed by f3. So f3 is the idea with the point of knight d5. And after this, black plays the final sort of defensive move, knight to d7. Sort of counterintuitive to give up this control over the d5 square, but now the point is black is forever in charge of these dark squares on the king's side, and that is going to be good enough uh, to uh, quite comfortably equalize here, and in some cases even play for more. Uh, white's idea was to play knight d5, and white should follow through on that, so knight d5 in the game. Bishop takes d5 now, queen takes d5, and after queen c7, you can already start to see uh, some forced repetitions by white. I think if white doesn't start repeating here, white is actually going to be worse, which is why this, this variation, I think, is, is quite strong. Uh, in this game, we saw queen c4. Uh, and now black actually very much is not interested in trading these queens. I think black is going to be pretty significantly worse if black does trade queens and allow, uh, allows this bishop to sort of just come into the game 
uh, with a, a devastating effect. So trading the queens is a big no-no, which is why black sort of needs to play the move queen d8 here. Uh, and then there are actually a couple games that went queen back to d5, queen back to c7, and so on and so forth. However, in our game, uh, white played the move king to b1 here. And black now just continues with rook c8, queen d5, queen c7, uh, c3 to defend this pawn. Uh, Marcus Ragger just goes ahead and castles kingside now. And now sort of the, the time has come for white to accept a repetition. Uh, if white continues playing on for too much longer, uh, you're going to start to run into uh, some, some pretty substantial risks here. So for example, if white plays something like bishop e2, uh, knight f6 can come. All of a sudden, this beautiful d5 square no longer belongs to you. Queen a5, for example, queen c6, rook h2 maybe, uh, and bishop d8, and all of a sudden, uh, the queen is running out of squares. Queen b4 is forced and black is ready to break in the center with d5. So if you're playing an opponent who absolutely does not want a repetition, this is sort of the way to keep the game going. They just sort of move some pieces around on the first couple of ranks. You start taking back these squares with knight f6, bishop d8, and, and playing for d5. And this is the way to go for, for black, I believe. Now, in the game, in order to avoid ever being worse, uh, Etienne Bucro, uh played queen a5. We're still not interested in a queen trade, so queen c6 was played, uh, queen b4 was played now, and Marcus Ragger just brings the queen back to uh, c7. Uh, now, if white isn't careful, black might also go for stuff like rook b8 and b5, and white just went queen a5, and the game was agreed to a draw with this repetition sort of being implied here. Uh, and you're going to run into a, a little bit of this in, in this sort of line. If black wanted to here, though, you can actually keep the game going with something like queen to b8. And like I said, still playing for stuff like b5, bringing rooks to uh, the open, to the center file and the c file. And stuff like bishop g5 is definitely playable as well here for, uh, for black. Just as an example line, something like bishop b2, rook fd8, knight d2, bishop g5, knight c4, for example. You could trade these guys off, stick a knight on f4. And this is sort of a good scenario for black, but not a totally unreasonable one, right? Play bishop g5, trade off the bishops, plant this knight on f4, and your dark square control on the king side of the board is going to be very, very good for black, in my opinion. And just a few more random moves. For example, play b5, take a guy, rook b5, stuff like this. Uh, playing for an attack on the queen side, and also making use of these dark squares on the king side. Uh, and yeah, this I think is just a, a very robust uh, defense for black here. Once again, going through it, uh, if G, if bishop e3 rather, we transpose to the English attack with bishop e6. If the move g4, well then h6 is the idea. And then the line I recommend is this idea where you take over all of the dark squares on the king's side of the board. Uh, good stuff. Any questions on this one? <clears throat> Ah, and we have Julian in the chat. So did I look at knight e2 and knight g1? I'm going to level with you, Julian. Did not look at that. Did not look at that. We were having the queen on d5 and not a knight. Well, obviously, in all of those uh, model knight orf games by white, uh, you, you, they just plant a, a knight on d5. But when black plays well, generally that knight should not be surviving on the d5 square, or else you have some problems. Well, we'll see uh, MVL Nidorf and the candidates. Um, I don't know, Dronus. I don't even remember. Has he already played the Nidorf? It's been like a year. It's been like a year. How am I supposed to remember what's going on in the current candidates tournament? Um, anyways, let us move on to our final variation of the night that I want to go over in a game between Michael Adams and Luke Loic. I, I never knew how to say his first name. I also don't know how to say his last name, but it is Van Wele. Or Veli? Veli? Van Veli? Van Veli? I don't know. Anyways, here's their chess game. E4, C5, and we have, again, the Nidorf variation with 6, H3, and E5. Now, I did promise I would briefly mention Knight back to F3. 
Uh, as I said, I think this move makes the least sense with uh, the pawn on h3. If white wanted to play like this, I think bishop e2 would have been a better way, and this is a, a much more sensible line. I think with h3 and the bishop on f1, white sort of just gets a worse version of this. So if you want more guidance on that type of variation, I would recommend watching the bishop e2 lecture again. Uh, one of them, I think there were two actually, but just briefly I will mention, you just develop your pieces, right? Bishop e7. And white's attempt at an improvement now is putting the bishop on c4 instead of e2. But we're perfectly happy to play the move bishop e6 now and just contest this uh, diagonal like this. If white ever captures on e6, this structure, uh, as hopefully you know by now, is generally just good for black. We get to defend the d5 square. And unless white plays some very serious tactics right away involving capturing on e6, then, uh, then black is going to be a, a bit better here. Um, and sorry, I related this line to the bishop e2, knight f3 stuff. But perhaps it's a little bit more sensible to also compare it to some bishop c4 stuff, because that's what happens in the fischer sozin But uh, as, as in those bishop c4 lines as well, uh, you always just put this bishop on e6 and try and contest the bishop uh, in that manner. Just an example line, bishop b3, castles, castles, go b5, knight bd7, and knight c5. And uh, yeah, black is, is doing totally fine here. The only thing to keep in mind is you should not hang this pawn with a fork, and rather contest this knight here. And this stuff is perfectly reasonable now for, uh, for black. OK, don't want to spend too much time there, because we've gone over stuff like knight f3 before. And like I said, I think it makes the least sense in, in this line with h3, compared to those other variations where we see the knight go back to f3. Anyways, knight d to e2. Uh, h5 is the line I'm recommending. And we took a look at the main variation with the move g3. And now I want to take a look at this move bishop g5 as well. Uh, this is sort of the principled approach to uh, punishing the move h5. You say, ha, you played h5. I was so clever with my waiting move h3. I didn't even put my bishop on e3 first, so I'm not wasting a tempo by putting it on g5. Now you look like a fool. I will pin your knight to your queen, take over the d5 square, and black is busted. Uh, which would be great if it were true, but I don't think it is. Uh, the line I recommend is actually to go bishop e7 here. I think bishop e6 is a bit more popular, but bishop e7 uh, sort of narrowed, narrows down the possibilities quite a bit. If I wanted to recommend bishop e6, I looked at that for a long, long time, and there's just there's too much to know, and I don't... If, if, if black goes wrong, I think black goes really, really wrong if he plays bishop e6. I think bishop e7, just a little bit simpler. So, what's the point of bishop e7? Well, let's compare it to bishop e6 for a second. If black plays bishop e6, he has to contend with bishop takes f6 and knight d5, queen d8. Now, the idea of bishop e7 is you can get this position, but the bishop is on g5 instead of f8. And that seems pretty good. So, compared to that, if, black, if white now captures on f6, goes knight d5, bishop g5, we don't quite get the same position because our bishop is still on c8, but I think this tempo is better spent putting a bishop on g5 than putting the bishop on e6 because after the move knight e to c3, bam, look at that, we got the bishop to e6 anyways. Essentially what I'm saying is if we got um, this position here after bishop e6, if I can, and we could play knight e c3, if bishop g5 were legal here, I would think black wants to play it. Uh, so that's the idea of the bishop e7 line. Uh, what's the downside? Well, I guess the downside is this knight g3 move. Uh, this is sort of the, the other option here. And for this move, we are going to turn to uh, a lovely game between Jeffrey Zhang with the white pieces uh, back in 2018 against somebody by the name of Koval, 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 Kovalyov. 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 Apologies to Kovalyov. I feel like that's a name I've read but have never really had to say out loud until this exact moment. Uh, anyways, with knight g3, of course, uh, white is threatening to step into the f5 square, so I think g6 makes the most sense here, just uh, shoring up the light squares. White can then bring this bishop out to c4, and things are starting to look a little bit more scary here on the king's side for black. Of course, we weakened our knight on f6, which softens up the f file, and white is now aiming at many of those squares. But I think the way Kovalyov handled it wasn't bad. 
bishop e6 is the standard response to bishop uh, c4, and it makes sense here. Once again, we are not too worried about this pawn structure because it gives us good control over d5. Admittedly, this is a worse version than normal because this pawn is on g6 rather than g7, but I do think black is still doing perfectly fine here. Uh, for example, to continue, we're going to play knight bd7, stuff like queen b6, uh, stuff like knight c5, and I think black is, is doing okay. Uh, bishop b3 was played in this game, and now knight bd7, queen f3, knight c5 is all fairly normal stuff, queen side castles. And now in the game between Zhang and Kovalyov, knight f to d7 was played, and I think this move is actually pretty bad. Uh, because after knight f to d7, bishop takes e7, queen takes e7, bishop takes e6 is actually a bit of a tactical threat. Uh, like I said previously, f takes e6 is the standard way black would love to respond, but because we played this stupid move, now all of a sudden b4 is trapping our knight. So I am not going to recommend you play the way that Kovalyov played with knight f to d7, but I do think black is still perfectly fine if you start with this move b5, giving this knight a flight square, and ideas of knight f to d7, or maybe even knight h7, can follow in many cases. Uh, after something like king b1, an improving move for white, uh, something like b4 could be played, but I like the move knight takes b3, and this immediately sort of simplifies the position into something that uh, can very easily be evaluated. So knight takes b3, a takes b3, b4 now uh, hits this knight, and rather than put it, put it on d5 immediately, uh, white should try and trade this bishop for this knight, I believe. And now after knight d5, bishop takes d5, rook takes d5. At first glance, you might say, hey, wait a second, this knight is going to go there, and my bishop looks bad. Why is black not worse here? And I think the reason that black isn't worse here is because, yes, given four free tempi, this knight's going to land on d5, and black's going to be a little sad. Uh, then I think white would be better. However, I don't think that that's going to actually happen uh, because black has a very clear play, clear plan rather, to get counterplay by opening up this A file, whereas white is not really busting open uh, black's kingside uh, too, too quickly. So for example, bishop back to e7 makes sense to guard this pawn, something like rook h to d1, queen c7, knight f1 should be played starting this rerouting maneuver. Uh, but now a5, for example, knight e3, a4, and yeah, I, I think black is doing fine here. Rook b5, for example, something like a b3, c b3, even bishop g5 could be played, queen a7. There are plenty of moves here for black, and black shouldn't be worse because he does have this counterplay uh, against the white king. And maybe taking on b3 is, is even a bit unnecessary, something like e5, and, and this immediately could be a bit better. Um, okay. So that is not the main move, though, that I wanted to look at here. Uh, let's look at what happens after bishop takes f6, takes f6, and knight d5, because this line is actually a bit more common uh, in the database that I am using. <clears throat> OK. All right. A lot of talking tonight. Always a lot of talking for me in my lectures. Bishop g5 was the point. We get this bishop out to g5, knight e to c3, and bishop e6. Uh, now white should play the move bishop c4. His whole point is to uh, really take over the d5 square in this case. But now I think knight c6 is fine for black as Venveli played in this game. Castles. And g6 is played anyways to again just shore up some of these light squares uh, in black's camp. Uh, queen d3 by Mickey Adams. We see kingside castles. Rook a d1. Rook c8 now putting the rook on the open c file. And yeah, uh, I'm playing through these moves pretty quickly, but by this point in the series, this is all stuff we've seen before, right? Uh, I guess the difference is this knight on d5 usually isn't around this long uh, for us to worry about. But uh, black is just playing the normal knight of moves here. He, he put the bishop out on g5, this bishop on e6, and he's looking to expand on the queen side. You know, it's stuff we've seen a thousand times before already. It's the typical knight of ideas that hopefully you guys are getting to be familiar with now. Uh, bishop b3 by white to put this bishop on a less loose square. And bishop h6 is Van Veli's choice in this game. Uh, really, black could play a number of things here. King h7 is an improving move. Um, 
And b5 is probably the one thing you shouldn't do, because a4 is actually going to be a little bit annoying in this case. But uh, maybe even this black can get away with. I'm just not super happy about weakening these light squares. But yeah, plenty of moves here. Knight a5 is also a fine move. King g7 is improving. Uh, plenty of options here for black. Bishop h6 was just the one that Van Veli chose. And now knight back to e3 is actually Mickey Adams' choice. Uh, perhaps revealing that, yeah, this knight on d5 is great and all, but I also want to attack your d6 pawn. And from here, knight d4 was played in the game to block off this file, and this is the reason why we put this knight on c6. You know, white sort of wholeheartedly committed to controlling d5, and in doing so, has left d4 uh, available to us. Uh, bishop takes e6, f takes e6 played in this case, and now white's big dream of controlling d5 is sort of shattered by uh, allowing us to take back with this f pawn. Uh, knight e2 was played by Mickey Adams, and again, his idea is to target this d6 pawn. But now after queen b6 by Vinvelli, c3 finally removes this knight, but we see takes, takes. Uh, and then here, black can actually do a number of things, including pass, uh, bring a rook to d8. Uh, pretty much anything here is going to be fine for black, but Vinvelli shows the simplest, which is to take off this knight, f takes e3, take off this rook, rook f8, rook d1, king g7. And this game continued for a while, but black was never really in any danger here. Uh, white is sort of claiming that d6 is going to be weak, but with only two major pieces left on the board, it's not going to be a big deal. Black's king is never really going to get into trouble. White also has some weaknesses to contend with on the queen side, and this is just uh, total equality here. Uh, nothing really going to go wrong for black in this case. Uh, and yeah, I think that just about covers pretty much everything I wanted to talk about today. We did go through things rather quickly, so I want to open it up to any questions, and very quickly, I will review what we're talking about here. So h3, h5, g3 is the main move we covered first. Bishop g5 was played in this game. I recommend bishop e7, which is an improvement over bishop e6, I claim, because if takes takes, as we see in the main line, we get this bishop to g5 instead of stuck on f8. Um, the issue with this is that knight g3 is a potential move now. We've weakened our g7 square, so we should probably go g6. There's also a line with h4, but I don't trust it, so just go g6. And the idea now is that after bishop c4, we want to contest this bishop, put our knight on c5, and again, go for counterplay on the queen's side. So any questions? <clears throat> uh, Dark Engine says, what do you do to practice memorization? The variations are similar, so it's harder to in ingrain the subtleties of each. So there are a lot of things you can do for uh, sort of memorization. Uh, I know like Chessable is, is great at this sort of spaced repetition stuff that they talk about, but basically I don't consider myself as having successfully remembered something unless I remember the reason why it's a good move. So whenever I'm sort of studying these, these lines, I'll sort of say not, uh, you know, bishop b7 and then check and see if I was right. I will say to myself in my head, okay, I think it's bishop e7, but why would it be bishop e7 here? And if I can't come up with that justification, then I, I haven't actually learned the move. So whenever I'm studying, I don't say, okay, bishop g5, bishop e7. I say bishop g5, okay, bishop e7, because if captures, I want to put the bishop on g5, right? And this is the difference. So if you are able to tell yourself this difference between the line you play and the other line, then you should be able to both understand it and, and remember it a little bit better. So obviously, that's rather difficult sometimes, but that's the best advice I can give. So if you have all this safe somewhere in your you know, various opening files, definitely type in a note, this should be seven because, or in, maybe you wrote it down by hand because you're living in the 18th century. Bishop b7, because I want to put the bishop on g5. That's, that's the best thing to do. Um, OK, any other questions? How long can I study a move to know it very well? Well, when you can sort of recite what I've just said. You know, when you have the justification behind the move ingrained in your memory as, as well. Uh, every knight dwarf game is a tactical draw. Well, of course, as I sort of showed in the first game, um, we're sort of prepping for the worst case scenario here, which is our opponent knows everything, right? When the opponent knows everything, 
It's tough to play for more than a draw with the black pieces. But more often than not, your opponent is not going to know everything to the end, and you're going to get games like the first one we looked at tonight, where MVL was able to sort of understand, hey, it's the Nidorf, I put my pieces on squares, and I should be doing well, right? And then he was, and then he won the game. Uh, okay, so this is the ninth lecture of the Nidorf. I want to give you a little sneak peek at what we're doing to next week for the grand finale. So. This is our starting position of the Nidorf. If I'm not mistaken, we have covered this, we've 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 covered that, we've covered that move, we've covered that move. But it is, you know, a complex opening, even though in the first eight lectures we've covered all of these main variations. In, in next week's lecture for the grand finale, we are going over all the sidelines, so stuff like move, the move a3, stuff like the move a4, stuff like the move, let's see. What else can white do? g3 could be played. Uh, bishop d3 could be played, stuff like this. Um, there's others that I'm forgetting about, but all of those tricky sidelines that you are going to forget about, that's what we're going to cover uh, next week, and that'll be our big finale. We'll take a look at what happens when white doesn't play one of the main variations. So hopefully you guys are enjoying this Nidorf series. That is going to do it for us here this week. And if all goes according to plan, we will have the grand finale of the Nidorf next Monday. Hopefully you all can join me for that. And then we will move on to something new the week after that. You know, it's been a long, long time we've been talking about the Nidorf. Uh, I've really enjoyed it. Hopefully you have as well. If you are watching live, be sure to head over to the Twitch channel now where it will be Tactics Time with yours truly. I saw Talia doing some work on the tactics earlier today. We'll see if she made any progress, see if we can make some progress ourselves. Uh, and if you're watching the YouTube uh, video uh, recording, once again, thank you so much for watching. My name is Caleb Denby. Uh, I hope you enjoyed, and I will see you next time.